the four her suit, sheepish men of credence Clearwater Revival were greeted as conquerors when they arrived in London in April 1970. From humble beginnings in suburban San Francisco, the quartet had ascended, in barely a year, to the absolute height of late 60s rock stardom. Thade headlined Woodstock, released an ongoing run of multi-platinum albums and singles, and in 1969, did what seemed impossible at the time, they outsold the Beatles. They looked hale and healthy, too, muscular but bashful dudes in army surplus jackets and flannel shirts. They lacked any real group personality or public image beyond tough guy smiles and ubiquitous hits. Meanwhile, the Beatles were looking lurid. Since 1968, the rumors were all about heroin and bitter interpersonal squabbles. Just as Credence arrived to begin their first European tour, Paul McCartney released advance copies of his first solo album to the media alongside a self-interview that referred to his break with the Beatles. There was suddenly no one left to outsell. For those next two weeks in April, Credence did what they always did, played an unchanging set for one adoring audience after another, then refused encores. Their shows were so consistent that they famously released a live at the Royal Albert Hall record that was actually recorded in Oakland. This was John Fogerty's policy, one of an increasing number of rules that had created to match his total control over their group's songs, production, and finances. His bandmates, drummer Doug Cosmo Clifford, bassist Stu Cook, and Fogerty's brother Tom on rhythm guitar, went home to the Bay Area with wonderful memories of their self-taught bashing ringing out in opera houses. But they also remembered standing just off stage, thousands of new fawning converts screaming for more, and the leader expending all his clout just to deprive them of that worship for some meaningless personal code. That was Credence Clearwater Revival in spring and summer of 1970, as they finished and released their fifth album, Cosmos Factory. They had started playing music together in middle school and had been slugging their way through a music career for more than a decade in various iterations. There was the studio session backing an over-the-hill doo-wop singer, the years were Tom on lead vocals, the costumed jangly years as the gollywogs. Having now achieved hard-won but revelatory success, they were still plagued by the same stubborn garbage, masculine hard wiring that they'd been carrying since adolescence. They were all raw nerves and personal vendettas but were operating musically like one four-limbed brain. You must remember, literally and figuratively, they were brothers. When you hear one of those songs, you know the ones, in Vietnam movies, The Big Lebowski, Classic Rock Radio, Your Uncle's Radio by the Grill, You're Hearing Bone Deep, Childhood Born Closeness and Codependency. They learned how to play instruments together, how to cultivate a discerning musical taste, how to give their music that elusive, ineffable in-between that their bluesmen and RB heroes had. They started with Square's Vulgarage band Dance Party Stuff, then slowly absorbed Booker T, The MGs, Bakersfield Country, Lightning Hopkins, Roy Orbison, Muddy Waters. John Fogerty grew into his role as band leader while Phil Spector, Brian Wilson, and Barry Gordy were developing instantly recognizable musical brands. They had sounds as distinctive as Sun Chess, which Fogerty also revered for their spareness and guitar tones. This was hardly in step with the psychedelic music that Credence's Bay Area peers were developing, but Fogerty was resolute. He was developing an entire aesthetic vision and the whole responsibility for enacting it rested on his brother and his schoolmates. Cosmos Factory begins with the purest expression of those varied inspirations and pressures that the band ever recorded. Ramble Tamble has somehow escaped the kind of classic rock canonization of Black Dog or Barbara Orly as an epic album opener, but it stands tall among them. It opens with a jaunty country funk riff that sounds almost like James Brown once the band kicks in, then they instantly switch gears into roaring double-time rockabilly. Fogerty's guitar and howling vocals are both treated with the same ghostly slapback effect that had borrowed from Sun and Chess. He shout sings one of his signature apocalyptic scenes, of images of junk and ruin, like Bad Moon Rising but Furious. Then the band slows down, Fogerty's sketch of mud in the water, Bugs in the Sugar comes to a halt and is replaced with a slowly building space rock squall unlike anything that Credence, typically so earthbound, ever recorded. Then they dissolve that and rebuild the rockabilly section, where Fogerty returns to his angry preacher routine. Had written about Spectres and New Dawns before, but this was the first time that had conveyed the idea in music itself. Ramble Tamble sounds like a band fighting its way to find new horizons, new styles, all the way past language in the title. 
Near the end of the record, the 11-minute take on I Heard It Through the Grapevine reverses the opening song's sense of adventurousness, turning Motown's sophisticated dance song into a droning, claustrophobic blues. The rest of Cosmos Factory is a hodgepodge, which was typical of Credence's lengths. Between the extended tracks and a handful of previously released hits like Travel and Band and Long As I Can See the Light, they included lively but inessential covers like Hooby Dooby and Before You Accuse Me. It's not a statement record or some kind of grand step forward in the band's evolution. It's just an unpretentious collection of songs, named for the little San Francisco practice space and featuring one of the least affected album covers of the classic rock era. Somehow, in 1970, the year of Kent State, the My Lai Massacre trial, and Let It Be, no album spent longer at number one in the U.S. Credence broke up within two years. Their roiling interpersonal difficulties explain the brevity of Credence's success, but what accounts for its intensity? How did a band so far apart from their peers and son Trendy become the most popular group in America? And during a time of so much unrest, Credence never wrote a love song, barely ever used vocal harmony, never employed guest musicians, and had a strict and mutually agreed upon policy against alcohol and drug use during music making. They were not exactly the face of late 60s youth culture, but they were its most consistent soundtrack. Those earlier iterations of the band were all relatively square, a garage band, a little band is how John Fogerty described them. It was his twin obsessions with recording technology and old blues that opened the band to new vistas. Starting with Born on the Bayou, from the first of their number one albums in 1969, Bayou Country, Fogarty summoned a mythic rock and roll south lyrically as well as musically. His songs were A Spare and Titus Stax, whose records, along with Wilson's Inspectors, he stew like a scholar. But his words could bend toward Uncle Remus of the Book of Revelations. On Cosmos Factory, Look and Out My Back Door is the former and Run Through the Jungle is the latter. Backdoor paints a children's book scene of dancing animals, while Jungle, a staple of Vietnam movies, depicts a literal army of Satan. Fogarty didnt write from one clear vision for America instead, he tried different visions on like hats, singing passionately about lazy riverboat days as well as societal collapse. Another Cosmos Factory standout, While Stop the Rain, depicts a storm that lasts generations, leaving widespread sadness and confusion. Moments of great civil unrest tend to refocus our view of the past. We see previously overlooked steps to destruction with renewed clarity. The Vietnam era spawned many pop acts with a deep sense of history, from the band's Faulknerian evocations to the nitty gritty dirt band's epochal bluegrass love letter. Will the circle be unbroken? But none had John Fogerty's monastic understanding of pop record structure or his clear eyed obsession with instrument separation. They had notable album tracks throughout their career, but Credence were a singles band, where Fogarty's fussy, learned vision was best expressed and his sidemen showed themselves of highest musical sensitivity. Listen to the way they push and pull Fogarty throughout Heard It Through the Grapevine, following his solo as much as prodding it on. The simple gallop of Ubi Doobie is just marvelous from the first note, while Long As I Can See the Light stands as one of Credence's most powerful ballads and soulful, nuanced band performances. Clifford's bass drum alone makes the song sound heartbreaking. So it almost seems silly to ask why Credence and Cosmos Factory were so popular as the country burned. They played 70s rock with the emotional intensity of early RB and the workaholic tightness of the Muscle Shoals or Dixie Flyers bands. They defined the early years of album rock, but their background was in the single format. For all their R shucks media personalities, their sound was flexible enough to be fun, angry, sorrowful, or worried. They were a band that could match the sweaty, crowded emotional tenor of America it wore, and they could please anyone but themselves. 